Thank you, everyone, for staying till the bitter end. This is the fourth and last panel uh, before the keynote. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay, awesome. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for staying. Um, echoing what everybody has said before me, thank you to um, the, uh, Dean Freeman, who is back here, and all of the staff in LAS who have done such a phenomenal job to Jonathan and the organizing committee. Um, it's wonderful to be here and um, be a part of this conference. So thank you all for this symposium. This last panel, um, as Jonathan um, announced in the morning, is titled Displacement. Um, and I will be chairing the panel. Uh, my name is Gayathri Reddy. I'm an associate professor of gender and women's studies and anthropology here at UIC. Um, and also the co-PI of the Diaspora Cluster and um, the co-founder with Anna of the Displacements Project that Anna's gonna be speaking about today a little bit. Um, so this panel um, is um, titled Displacement and I'll just very briefly read out the, um, our, our, um, uh, our abstract that kind of lays out sort of the broad parameters of the, of the panel, and then I'll introduce the first speaker who unfortunately cannot be here, but um, has recorded his presentation and will be here on Zoom for the Q&A. So it's gonna be a, a interesting technical challenge to make sure that uh, he is able to participate, but here we go. So the panel, as I said, is titled Displacement, and it draws on sort of archival research, on oral history interviews, on ancestral lived experiences, on performative public art and dance practice. And so this panel traces the long histories of displacement and the material and immaterial ways in which unbelonging and dispossession are marked on racialized bodies and communities in the US. It asks who belongs in this nation, this state, this neighborhood? What are some of the practices of containment through which racialized communities have experienced multiple forms of invisibilization, displacement, and dispossession? And how do struggles over land, housing, and basic human rights speak back to these ideologies and practices of displacement? And so drawing on a range of different media and forms of public engagement, this panel um, you, uh, not only serves as a medium for witnessing these struggles, but also visualizes modes of subaltern resistance in response to these sustained efforts at racial segregation, containment, deportation, and state violence. So with that, I will um, introduce the first speaker which I think Jonathan, um, had, in his opening remarks, referenced um, John Lowe, who will be the first presenter in this panel. Um, John Lowe is um, uh, a, an enrolled citizen of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi. He holds two BAs, an MA, a JD, and a PhD, and is currently an associate professor at the Ohio State University where he's also the director of the Newark Earthworks Center. He's an award-winning author, and his latest book is Imprints, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and the City of Chicago. And he will be speaking to us today via a prior recorded session, um, and the title of his presentation is Indian Removal from Chicago, From the Trail of Death to a Tale of Erasure. Right. So hopefully this works. Hello, everyone. Um, John Lau here. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, appear before you uh, via Zoom. I wish I could be there uh, in person, but am unable to. But uh, I've been given the opportunity to share this presentation with you. Uh, it comes from a uh, uh, article that I wrote and was published in uh, the spring 2023 issue of Chicago History Magazine. 
uh, if you would like a copy of that article, feel free to reach out to me through email, low.89 at osu.edu. So, title of the uh, uh, paper, hopefully fitting with the uh, themes of this uh, conference, is Indian Removal from Chicago, From the Trail of Death to a Tale of Erasure. Chicago is on the lands of the Potawatomi. Why a land acknowledgement for Chicago should acknowledge this historical fact? Well, it's sort of basic. A land acknowledgement should uh, acknowledge who were the original peoples of these lands and perhaps also include, preferably, a call to action also, right? So with land acknowledgements that I've been seeing uh, some have gotten it historically accurate and many have not. And so I'm going to discuss that, uh, why we need land acknowledgements to acknowledge whose homelands Chicago sits upon. So we know that there were a lot of people in Northern Illinois, uh, more than uh, 15, uh, uh, lots of folks. And this is a short, description, I'm not going to read through all the names, but there are people, uh, communities, tribal nations uh, that uh, I suspect some of you, if not many of you, are familiar with, right? So, no doubt this is an area with a lot of people, indigenous people living in this area. But, as far as creation stories, as far as I know, the Potawatomi are the only uh, tribal nation that has a creation story that uh, centers them in the <coughs> excuse me, Lake Michigan uh, area. I've heard from my elders creation stories that place us at uh, near Grand Rapids, near Milwaukee, near Chicago. We also have uh, creation stories uh, that uh, place us at the uh, Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. But uh, I don't believe any other uh, tribe, tribal nation situates its creation as being at or near Chicago. For instance, the uh, Miami, their creation story, I believe, is that uh, they were near Mishawaka, Indiana. Uh, the creation story of the Ojibwe and the Odawa is that uh, they're created either at the uh, Straits of Mackinac uh, or also at the uh, Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. I only point that out because it situates the Potawatomi as being here in Chicago from the beginning, at least according to some of our stories. So what's the controversy about? Uh, Part of the uh, controversy is that before uh, the Beaver Wars uh, that started in 1609, where the Iroquois moved into the uh, Great Lakes region and drove the Algonquian people, the residents of the area, from this area, fighting over the resource of beaver pelts, uh, there's no written records of who was where. We have to rely basically on our oral histories and our teachings. When Europeans came here, Joliet, Marquette, etc., when they got here and started writing things down, we were in the process of uh, post-Beaver War uh, trauma and diaspora. And so tribes that had lived here since the beginning were only returning here just as Europeans were arriving. So uh, Joliet and Marquette don't uh, write a lot about the Potawatomi, but we were moving in back into our homeland after uh, this Beaver War conclusion. So it's just a uh, 
accident of history that we don't have very good uh, information written by the settler colonists about who they encountered when they got here. But in our language, uh, we've uh, always been a part of uh, Chicago next uh, uh, since the beginning. So uh, I've got some evidence I'd like to share with you. Uh, the maps, uh, all of the villages, many of the villages, uh, this is just a list and I apologize for its length, but it just shows that you know, there are not villages in and around Chicago that are in with Miami names, with Ojibwe names, with Odawa names, with uh, Meskwaki names, with Menominee names, Ho-Chunk names. All the, the names are all Potawatomi. I've never seen a map that discloses locations of so many villages in and around Chicago, but in their Potawatomi names which would indicate that the Potawatomi were the people living in those villages, and the Potawatomi were the people who were naming those villages and occupying this space. So after the Beaver Wars, uh, we can see that uh, Chicago is included in this territory of the Potawatomi that ran from the uh, Keweenaw Peninsula, Green Bay, down to uh, uh, along the western shore of Lake Michigan, uh, to uh, north central Illinois, around Chicago, including Chicago, and up into uh, Michigan and Indiana, all the way to the Detroit and the Maumee River Valley near Toledo, Ohio. So we had a very large territory that we uh, are our homeland. This is another map that was established during uh, the uh, Indian Claims Commission to determine what areas were the lands of whom, the purpose of which was to ascertain who should be uh, entitled to any uh, treaty payments, any land payments, any unsettled claims. These court cases before the Indian uh, Court of Claims were uh, based upon uh, many times, not just legal arguments, not just historical arguments, but also the teachings of our elders. The elders testified in court as to who was where and when. And this is a map that reflects what that testimony reflected, that Chicago is on the lands of the Potawatomi. This is a map made by one of our uh, language specialist with Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, and it shows how many Potawatomi villages there were in and, uh, well, around Lake Michigan. A lot of them, right? All along that territory that I referenced earlier. And specifically, uh, Kyle Mallett, our advanced language specialist, has determined where our villages were Again, I'll make note that there's no indications that there were uh, complementary uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, Miami, or other nations, uh, villages so close to Chicago or Chicago. So I think these maps are pretty powerful, but I have more evidence. The treaties themselves. Oftentimes, uh, people will say, this is the lands of the Council of the Three Fires based upon the treaties that were written. But the treaties were written by the United States government, and they referred to us as the United Nation of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Indians. And that's a fiction, a federal government fiction. We were never a United Nation. We were never a council uh, in the way that the Iroquois had the, uh, their uh, tribes organized into individual tribal councils and then a grand council among the Onondaga. That's not how the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi were organized. We were referred to as the Council of the Three Fires and Three Fires people just to reflect that we were related to each other. 
that we are relatives, but we shared no government uh, amongst ourselves. There was no nation, uh, but uh, as uh, James Clifton has uh, said, uh, the historian James Clifton, uh, this was a fiction uh, that the United States government wanted to make sure that mo nobody claimed that they were exempt from removal from that 1833 treaty by claiming, oh, well, I'm not Potawatomi. Actually, on my mom's side, I'm Ojibwe, et cetera. You know, they wanted to include just a great sweeping away. And we know that that's what Indian removal was, was a great sweeping away. Uh, this is a uh, late 19th century mural uh, of that 1833 uh, Treaty of Chicago. And it refers to it as the last council of the Potawatomi. It was not understood that there were other people here, or it was not imagined that there were other people here. It was the Potawatomi people who were here. So in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, uh, Leopold Pokagan, our patriarch of our particular tribal nation, negotiated there along with other Potawatomi people and negotiated our exemption from removal and why we're still in Southwest Michigan and Northwest Indiana. So we're very close to Chicago, only some 70 miles away uh, to the east. And as James Clifton said, <clears throat> the so-called United Bands of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi were from villages in northern Illinois and south central Wisconsin. And the designation was misleading since all those involved were Potawatomi in social identity and political organization. The cover name merely recognized the fact that numerous Ottawa and a few Chippewa had earlier, earlier assimilated into the Potawatomi communities and that the Potawatomi proper had long-standing alliances with these other societies, but this was Potawatomi land. So after the trail, after the Treaty of 1833, there was a great sweeping away of the Potawatomi from Northwest Indiana, uh, Northern Illinois, South, Southern Wisconsin. If the tribes didn't flee to Canada or Northern Wisconsin, they were essentially swept up and removed except for the Pokagon Band, who had negotiated that exemption from a removal. This trail of death that we endured, there's no tale of other tribes being removed on the trail of death. There's no Ojibwe trail of death. There's no Ottawa, Odawa trail of death. The reason why it's the Potawatomi trail of death is we were the people that were here and we were the people that were being removed. The people. So when you think about uh, the historic figures uh, that you're familiar with, uh, Robinson, Wabonson, uh, Saganesh, Billy Caldwell, Shabona, all of these people were Potawatomi. Uh, I'm not familiar with, I'm not aware of any Ojibwe or Odawa chiefs that in the early 1800s, uh, we're here in Chicago. So we're all familiar with Usabo, uh, the sort of founding non-native person to this uh, city. And when he came here, he married a Potawatomi woman and was adopted into the Potawatomi tribe. He didn't marry an Ojibwe woman. He didn't marry an Odawa woman, a Miami woman, uh, a Meskwaki woman. He married a Potawatomi woman and was adopted into a Potawatomi family because that's who was here. It made only sense that, of course, he became Potawatomi. Of course, he married into the Potawatomi because we were the people that were here. So we're also the only uh, tribe to have sued for the Chicago Lakefront. We sued for the Chicago Lakefront as unceded territory uh, in 1914. It went to the United States Supreme Court in 1917. And I think it's a matter of sovereignty uh, is involved when we make claims about homeland. I don't think it's up to individuals 
to claim that it's my tribe's homeland. I don't think that's how sovereignty works. I, the, our tribe, the Potawatomi, sued the Chicago Lakefront. No other tribe has sued for any return or any recompense for Chicago. Why? Because this is Potawatomi land. So this is the current UIC land acknowledgement. And it uh, has the all too common uh, narrative of uh, UIC resides on the traditional territories of the Three Fires people. It doesn't. Uh, it re resides on the territories of the uh, Bodawadmi or the Potawatomi. And I'm not sure what the rest of it's referring to about purchased after two and a half years of open warfare, uh, but in any event, uh, it was the Potawatomi who fought at Fort Dearborn. It was the Potawatomi who signed the Treaty of Greenville that allowed for Fort Dearborn to even be created. That was Chief Tottenby, the first signatory to the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. It was the Potawatomi who were speaking at the Chicago Columbian Exposition, Simon Pokagan. It was the Potawatomi who sued the Chicago Lakefront. No other tribe has this history or this connection to Chicago other than the Potawatomi. So a proposed uh, land acknowledgement. The University of Illinois at Chicago is situated on the ancestral homeland for the Potawatomi who cared for the land until forced out by non-natives. Uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Miami, uh, Mascouten, uh, Sac and Fox, Kickapoo, Ho-Chunk, Manami, and other tribes whose names have been lost also gathered and traded in this region. We recognize that this was an intertribal area of traverse and trade. Today, Chicago is home to the largest urban indigenous population in the Midwest, and they continue to honor, honor this land with it and its waterways practices, practice traditions, and celebrate their heritage. And I believe every land acknowledgement should include a call to action. So. In, recogn in recognition of this, the University of Illinois at Chicago commits to, and then we need to fill in those blanks, or the UIC needs to fill in those blanks. So thank you for letting me share uh, this uh, moment, uh, this time with you. Uh, if you have any questions, I believe that uh, I'll be able to uh, answer those. I'm going to be online during the conference during this time. Again, if you'd like a copy of my paper from the Chicago History Magazine, uh, email me at lau, L -O -W dot 89 at osu dot edu. Miigwech, Iguan, Wawena. Thank you. The historical record and land acknowledgments and for helping us to think through sort of the importance of place of Chicago, what it means to be here and to be displaced from here. So the next presentation um, is by Jian Li, um, who um, is an interdisciplinary artist based in Chicago through performance objects and socially engaged art. Her work explores the dynamics of connection, power, violence, and resistance. She has worked with social justice and community-based organizations for over 30 years in immigrant rights, economic justice, LGBTQ issues, and domestic violence. She holds an MFA in fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art, an MA in ethnic studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in linguistics from Stanford University. And she will be speaking to us, um, also sort of speaking to a specific um, project that um, she has been involved with for several years titled Who's Lakefront? So give me one second to get us situated. <laughs> Okay, hello, is everybody awake? <laughs> Excellent, all right. 
so my name is Jian Lee. Uh, 안녕하세요. 제 이름은 이지연입니다. Um, and I want to start off by asking how many of you grew up uh, in and around Chicago? Okay, not that many. All right. And if you did grow up around here, did you know any of the information that Dr. Lau just talked about? A little? Uh huh. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's see. So I grew up. Uh, my family came to Chicago when I was nine, and uh, we had lived in all of these other places before that, starting on the, what is that, the east going west, uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Stockholm, Lancaster, and then Chicago. Um, and uh, no one told me any of these things when I was going to CPS, and after we moved to the suburbs, to one of the best public high schools in the nation, yeah, no one told me any of that. So, um, and partly because of having moved around a lot when I was young, I've always been interested and had to be interested in issues around place, language, culture, assimilation. Um, and when we came to the U.S. in 1980, uh, what my, my father was going to graduate school and my mother ended up um, working at and then becoming the owner of this store over on 47th Street in Bronzeville, which also nobody told me about. So as many of you I'm sure know, Bronzeville is the heart of what was called the Black Belt, where African Americans from the South coming here through the Great Migration were, uh, were confined um, and forced to live in very crowded conditions um, until they were able to win um, policies that allowed them to live in other places. So um, no one told me why our family, Korean immigrant family, would be having this store on the south side of Chicago where we did not live. We lived on the north side. And um, it was all a great mystery. So um, yeah, so partly uh, that mystery um, led me to um, graduate school in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley where I got to learn about things like the middleman minority. Um, and, uh, and many, many years later, after lots of working in different non nonprofits, um, I uh, decided to uh, focus on art. And um, it's been great. Uh, if any of you are ever thinking about it, I say go for it. Because um, in, <laughs> in the current age, you can do what you want and call it art. Um, <laughs> And that is a great thing because for me, that means like all of my interests in place, in migration, in racism, in colonization, um, and all of the uh, skills I have in project management and all of the research that I want to do because I'm a curious person and want to talk to people and learn about things, I can do that through art. So I went to art school in the Detroit area and how many of you have spent much time in Detroit? Ah, yes. So I had not. Um, and when I went to Detroit, I was shocked. Because um, uh, here in Chicago, as you know, we have great segregation. It, it, we are the heart of segregation. But in Detroit, that segregation not only exists, it exists along the city suburb border. And it is very apparent and it is very stark. And I didn't know my way around at all anyway. Um, so when I got to art school, this is what I ended up doing, um, is starting a series of walking projects, um, which is a lot of what my art has been about since then. Um, so using walking as a way to witness the histories and structures of racism and colonization that appear in every place that you ever are. Um, but most of the time, we don't pay attention to because you know we're going to school, we're going to work, and we're in a rush, and we're late. So, um, so, uh, so this first project was uh, walking these five roads. Um, someone had told me about these radial roads that go out from downtown Detroit, uh, which is where they all meet um, at, the, at the south. Um, and that those roads had been created by native people um, and, and some of them were also US military highways when there were forts. 
Uh, why were there forts? Because uh, the settlers needed to uh, fight off the native people. So, um, so I used this project as a way to try to learn as much as I could about Detroit um, and, uh, and, and look at uh, not only the histories, but also uh, the current situation of these neighborhoods and suburbs and towns and why they look the way that they looked. Um, I think you all know this. If you have your eyes open and you're in a particular neighborhood, if you look around, you can see if there's money in that neighborhood. You can see if there's been investment. You can see who lives there. You can see the class and the race of the people who live there just from looking at the built environment. So, um, yeah, so these were walks I did of 25 miles each. They took about 10 to 11 hours. It is a long time. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, 25 miles, um, when you go through, you go through the city and you go through parts that look like this, and then you go through parts that look like this. Um, and um, I, I learned a lot. And then I came back to Chicago, and I did a series of similar walks here, because um, we also have radio roads um, that cut through the grid that were created by Native people long before there were any uh, European settlers or other settlers of any kind. Um, and I, um, I started trying to learn all of this stuff that I did not know about Chicago, my hometown. Um, and so I read John Lyle's book and he was very gracious and kind to like answer to a cold email and just like talk to me. Um, and, um, and specifically uh, when I read the chapter about the lawsuit that he talked about for the lakefront Again, I was shocked because the lawsuit to me feels like a very modern instrument. Um, and um, because I did not have a lot of relationships with Native people and I was not plugged into the community and the activism and, um, uh, and, and sovereignty issues, uh, in my mind, as I think uh, exists in many other people's minds, Native people existed in the past. Um, and so seeing this very modern way of uh, resistance um, and fighting for sovereignty through, the, um, through this lawsuit um, was really eye-opening to me. And also just reading, reading the actual text itself, um, which is actually very short, um, uh, there were just uh, really dumb things, like the conclusion is really dumb. The only possible immemorial right which the Potawatomi Nation had in the country claimed as their own in 1795 was that of occupancy. So at least they recognized there was a right. If in any view it ever held possession of the property here in question, we know historically that this was abandoned long ago and that for more than half a century it has not even pretended to occupy either the shores or waters of Lake Michigan within the confines of Illinois. I don't know if you were able to get it from um, how Dr. Lau described the lawsuit, um, but the, the, uh, the basis of their claim was that um, all of the treaties, including the Treaty of Chicago, the boundary of the ceded land was the shoreline of Lake Michigan. And ever since settlers have settled here uh, in this area, uh, they have built out the lakefront. It is all landfill. and. Um, Oh, that's that. Anyway, um, where is it? Here. It is all landfill um, uh, built out um, ever since uh, there have been uh, European settlers here that settled here. Um, and so um, the Pokagon um, band had argued that all of that landfill was unceded territory and that therefore the city of Chicago should either give it back or pay for it. And you can see this was. This was the Supreme Court's decision, uh, is that they may have had a right of occupancy, but that they had given it up by not occupying, not occupying this land that existed under the water in 1833, um, and also by the terms of the Treaty of Chicago, uh, the, uh, the signers, the Potawatomi, had agreed to move, be removed uh, to Kansas, uh, west of the Mississippi, within three years of signing. So that's dumb. Um, anyway, so I'm Korean. Um, I come from a place that was also occupied. 
um, not for as long as the U.S. has been occupied and in a very different kind of way. But, um, uh, but I think we share something about um, we get a little mad, so this made me mad, um, and so I wanted to do something about it. So uh, when I talked to Dr. Lau, I said, well, I didn't know about this. I think many other people don't know about it. What if we do something that makes people know about it? And I said, well, how about if we draw this line down Michigan Avenue? Michigan Avenue just happens to be where the shoreline of Lake Michigan was in 1833. And I thought, well, why don't we just mark the land itself? This is the boundary between land that was nominally ceded, although that can be argued too, uh, versus the lake fill or landfill, which was never ceded. Um, so this was my initial rendering of it. Many years later, no, actually it was, <laughs> it was supposed to take place within a year and then because of the pandemic, it took two years um, and we ended up um, being able to do it in 2021. Um, there were many, uh, it was a big project. Um, part one was um, getting together uh, native folks um, who would be interested in working with me on this. Um, I'm not native, it didn't make sense to do it without um, consultation, direction, advisement, um, and Dr. Lau was kind enough to introduce me to some other members of his tribe, um, and I got in touch with the American Indian Center, and people introduced me to other people, including the Native American Support Program here at UIC, um, which was Jacob Adams at one point, and then Tol Foster, who is the director there now, um, who were very supportive. Um, and I learned a lot, and I still have much, much more to learn about um, working with Native folks and navigating um, dynamics within the community. Um, and, um, and then this, so, so we made this line, um, uh, not this line specifically, but uh, from Roosevelt up to uh, just north of the Chicago River. And we decided to use sand because that's what that shoreline was, was sand dunes. And uh, I got 2,000 pounds of red sand from a company in Canada called Sandtastic. <laughs> and uh, we figured out how to make a line on the ground. And then in October of 2021, we had a procession. Um, yeah, it was amazing. We were about 130 people. Um, and uh, a number of women elders from the Pokagon Band came and led the procession, as well as a couple of um, uh, Native veterans uh, who live in Chicago. Um, and um, we made a mile and a half of red sand along Michigan Avenue, um, passing by really the heart of downtown, as you all know, and passing by uh, various monuments to settler colonialism. Um, as well as um, this that I'm guessing many of you have seen, which is by Andrea Carlson, an Ojibwe artist um, based here in Chicago now, who was also on the planning committee for this Who's Lakefront um, project. Uh, we put up posters, um, uh, handed out postcards, and um, uh, made this website um, thanks to uh, a graphic design class um, of students, um, who's lakefront.com, and it's still live, and it was just the place that I wanted to put all of the resources, all of the research, all of the information that we were drawing on. Um, look at that, we had a drone, um, and you can see the line and the people, um, and the line existed for a few days until the city uh, cleaned it up. Uh, that was another big part of uh, this project was navigating the bureaucracy of uh, getting to do this project in public space, uh, which just sort of encap encapsulates all of the issues around who owns the land, who controls the land, who decides what gets to happen on this land. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, look at that. There was a line of red sand on Michigan Avenue downtown. That's like a real place where real people go. Um, and, um, and there's a, we made a video documentary, it's available on YouTube. Um, and ah, so uh, following up on that, I'm currently uh, working on a related project, um, learning about the actual construction of the landfill itself was fascinating. Um, there is garbage in there. Uh, there's the rubble from the Great Chicago Fire. 
Uh, there is a slag from U.S. Steel um, that was never sanctioned by anybody um, that they made to expand the factory land. Um, I'm going to finish. Thank you. And um, uh, and so this this project called Shoreland um, is a series of walks, um, uh, audio narratives that you can listen to while you walk. Um, so they're uh, tied to six different points along the lakefront. They have slightly different themes. It is the text of the treaties and the lawsuits and the legislation. All of that landfill didn't happen by sheer willpower. It was a lot of legislation and lawsuits um, and a lot of what I call settler engineering. So, um, so that's gonna that's that's gonna happen um, uh, uh, this summer. So if you're interested. Um, the information is, is on my website, and I'm also on Instagram. Um, but I just wanted to end with this slide to acknowledge all of the people on the planning committee, as well as many friends, including people in the audience, um, who made this really big thing happen. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gian, um, for um, getting us to continue to think about place, to think about art as a way in which to connect with um, um, some of what we do in the university um, and what the talks have been speaking to and to think about settler engineering um, and to continue to get us to think about place in a, a different context and to think about bodies out of place. Um, the next presentation is by uh, Mario Lamont. Mario, um, Dr. L Mario Lamotte is an assistant professor of black studies and anthropology at UIC and also a member of the diaspora studies cluster. His research centers embodied pedagogies of Caribbean arts and expressive cultures and the intersection of queer life worlds and social justice in Haiti. A performance artist, his work has, app his work has appeared in multiple journals um, and edited volumes. Um, including uh, the co-edited volume, Time Signatures, Race and Performance After Repetition. Mario Lamotte holds a PhD in Performance Studies from Northwestern University, and his talk today is titled Chrome Avenue, Haiti, Gynecomastia, and U.S. Detention Centers. Bonjour, bonsoir, good afternoon. Detained Haitian men developing big breasts. In the course of my postdoctoral research at Duke University's Haiti archives years ago, I came across this startling, somewhat salacious headline from a May 1982 issue of the New York Amsterdam News, the city's long-running black newspaper. In 1981, a year before AIDS was named so, and two years before people from Haiti were wrongly, accu um, wrongly accused for bringing, bringing it to the United States, dozen of Haitian men held in U.S. detention centers grew breasts. The story sounds like the perverse magical realism associated with Haiti by some in the global imagination. But it was very ordinary racism. Racist immigration policy coupled with racist fear of Haitian contagion and of the bodies of black people. To paraphrase many scholars of Haiti, studies have illustrated how Haiti has long been depicted as a strange and hopelessly diseased country, remarkable chiefly for its 1884 liberation from the French and its ensuing embargo by colonial powers. These resulted into an extreme isolation from nation-building international exchanges 
Or, as in a 1989 Vanity Fair headline, Haiti, a bazaar of the bazaar. This afternoon, I, have, I offer highlights of a 45-minute polyvocal protest piece I last performed in 2018 at a dance and theater arts festival. I began semi-nude, exposing my own Haitian flesh and empathy and intention with these men suffering and slowly dressed up by the conclusion. This is not possible today given the time con constraints, but I'm happy to discuss the intention behind that choice in the Q&A. Instead, I adopt and retell remains of a story in a mode of critical fabulation that retraces how Haitian freedom is closely monitored. In terms of my own theoretical inclination, reading this particular headline um, as another trivialization of Haitianness triggered an instance of dédoublage, a fully embodied and continuous process that invokes Haitians' voluntary or coerced acts of self-doubling shape-shifting and symbolic teleportation through phobias and prescriptions at home and elsewhere. These Haitians, too, underwent performances of dédoublage as their bodies were used to punish black difference, positionality, and nonconformity as they maneuvered through American anti-Haitianism and anti-blackness. My Dedu Blash today invites you to be witnesses of a unique story about Haitians' physical statelessness juxtaposed with archived radio interviews with people who dared to brave the seas around that time. As Haitian people crossed the Caribbean Ocean to flee government repression, the CDC infamously identified four risk groups for HIV AIDS. These were the so-called four H's, homosexuals, heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians, the only black and very specific ethno-national group among the cluster. The long-term effects of this stigma were, of course, particularly devastating to gay men and to Haitian people, two groups who had been socially vulnerable and marginalized long before AIDS appeared. According to the CDC, the exact risk factor, quote unquote, for Haitian people was unknown. Haitians were not any more biologically susceptible to HIV AIDS than people of any other nationality. The elusive unknown risk factor was Haiti's history of colonization, exploitation, poverty, and voodoo, as detailed, for instance, by Paul Farmer's AIDS and accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame. In the name of delousing these supposed AIDS and voodoo bodies, government employees at Chrome Detention Center in Miami, Fort Allen in Puerto Rico, and other detention centers doused migrants from Haiti with an insecticide spray containing phenotrin, a compound with anti-androgenic properties, and slathered them with quell lotion, which contained lindane, a weak estrogen. The spray was labeled not to be used on humans or animals. The lotion was by prescription only, to be used in small quantities and for a limited time. The New York Times, which covered the case years later, underscored that immigration authorities applied quell lotion to Haitian migrants with a paintbrush, often repeatedly, even when they had no symptoms of lice. Quote, it was a policy at Chrome to de-louse only the Haitians. Cubans and other undocumented aliens were not de upon arrival, end quote. The testosterone-suppressing and estrogen-boosting properties of these two products, misused, applied improperly, and in excess, caused these Haitian men to develop breasts. For the Haitians who had risked their lives at sea to be held in detention centers where their bodies were feared, abused, and deformed, it was a question of courir pour la pluie tomber dans la rivière, running from the rain only to fall into the river. I mentioned the epidemic of gynecomastia, unusual growth of male breast tissue to several scholars of Haiti and immigration rights, none of whom had ever heard of it. Few mainstream media sources seem to have picked up on the story as it unfolded then. In April 1982, the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report contained a short article that concluded, quote, 
two possible hypotheses to explain these cases of gynecomastia are, one, that the diet of Haitians improved greatly after they arrived in the US, causing refeeding gynecomastia, or two, that the affected men were exposed to an estrogen or estrogen-like substance during processing of chrome, end quote. These are the people from shithole countries, as the former president declared. These are the people whose suffering Americans continue to construe as a, as a threat if the September 2021 whipping of Asian migrants at the Del Rio border is any evidence. These are the people whose bodies are viewed either as a source of disease or a source of labor, but never, it seems, as bodies deserving of protection, whom in sensational news cycle are featured as fatalistic, persistent, callous, overwrought, unfeeling, and thus outside of humanity without naming the white supremacist and American racial capitalist manipulations of the country's environmental and sociopolitical degradations. I hate to do this piece. <laughs> Who are these migrants who had taken to the sea in the early 1980s? The US government classified them as economic migrants seeking opportunity abroad rather than political refugees. In other words, they were fleeing poverty rather than persecution. This distinction relies on an artificial and arbitrary separation of the economic and the political. In the 1970s and 1980s, millions of Asian people were, who were not direct victims of the Duvalier regime's violent oppression, who were not among the political prisoners tortured and killed, oftentimes publicly, were nonetheless victims of the dictatorship. The poverty and hunger they, they fled resulted from the exploitation, land dispossession, and taxation of the Haitian poor by the Totomakut, the Duvalier's henchmen, and capricious and greedy authority figures. The distinction between economic migrants and political refugees relies as well on political expediency, as far as the US is concerned. Jean-Claude Duvalier, the younger man in the image, um, Jean-Claude Duvalier's government um, was inarguably repressive, even if it wore a veneer of liberalism in comparison to his father's regime. Jean-Claude was a right-wing dictator. He was also the US's man in the Caribbean, like his father before him, an avowed anti-communist, a hop, skip, and a jump from Cuba. We, the United States, funneled aid money to his government. And after the election of Ronald Reagan in November 19, in 1980, the, the Haitian government no longer had to pay even lip service to human rights. In the spring of 1980, anti-Duvalier journalists Comper Filo and Jacques Price, who were later persecuted, tortured, and exiled, condemned the dictatorship repeatedly by interviewing people as they prepared to flee and by airing their stories. Quote, people in the hole can't breathe, shared a man before his second crossing attempt. There are Haitians who go mad, who fall into the sea, even if you're his brother, you can't speak up, shut your trap. If you get angry, you'll be in the water too. Even if it's your mother, let her drown, shut your mouth, don't speak. When you get to Canal du Vent between Haiti and Cuba, you're going to puke your guts out against the roiling sea. If it's their day, they'll get there. If it's not their day, death will take them. They will not see the promised land. Ah, I'd see it's, it's its own kind of misery, explained the man. We're all crammed together like how, you, how they pack cans of milk. Women, well, women, when they have their blood, there's not even water for, for them to wash themselves. When the captain is going to sleep at night, uh, he looks down in the hold, and if he finds a girl who looks good and healthy, healthy, he sleeps with her. The captain will give them water to wash themselves, and they'll sleep together. Even if the captain mistreats her after, some of the women think that they are lucky to be chosen, end quote. But we know all too well that there's more to the story than a man's perspective of women servicing a captain in this manner. That same spring of 1980, journalist Jean-Dominique and Michel Montas reported from Miami on the prejudicial treatment of Haitian asylum seekers under US immigration policy. 
Montas interviewed the deputy director of immigration services. Quote, the Cuban, when they arrive at Key West to a man, their story is, I'm leaving um, Cuba because of the political situation, and if I return, I would be, you know, which is a claim for to political asylum. The Haitian inevitably, on the first contact with us, when he steps off the boat, he says, I'm looking for a job. I'm coming here to work. I want to support my family. You know, we have this humanitarian feeling for these people, but this does not meet the definition of political asylum. Therefore, we do not accept it at that point as a political asylum claim. However, once the person gets into the community and he seems to meet, he meets the other Haitians who are here and the attorneys involved, he learns very quickly, ah, you must say these magic words. At that time, he comes back and says, give me the papers for political asylum. Our position relative to the Haitians is that we don't feel that they are persecuted when they are returned to Haiti. We have no proof through the Department of State, of course, who is our eyes and ears in foreign countries that would convince us that they fear uh, persecution if they are returned. In a more just world, immigration policy would not hinge upon the victim's ability to frame and package their own suffering in institutionally approved ways. But so many rights-based claims do in the Haitian context and elsewhere. The immigration official expressed scorn for Haitian asylum seekers who learn the right way to tell their stories as though they were savagely trying to game the system. He seemed not to consider or to care that Haitians might have an equally valid claim to political oppression as Cuban refugees, that the difference was not a degree of quality of suffering, but of knowing the narrative. Jean-Dominique closed the broadcast with a call for solidarity. Political refugees are political asylum seekers. The Haitians are here, their desperate odyssey their silent determination to work, the fear that fills their eyes. All of this is laid out in the United States on the front page of the daily paper, on the television screen, commented upon on the radio. All of this rallies certain conscious Americans just as it, as it weighs upon our own conscious. Without a doubt, there are other boat people throughout the world, but these, they are our brothers, and we're all responsible for them, and of commentary. They were not only Haitian, there were men, there were adult men, there were adult black men. When was the last time you saw a brochure for a humanitarian agency with a glossy image of an able-bodied black man on the cover? If there are institutionally approved ways of narrating one, one's own trauma in order to be considered a legitimate victim, there are also categories of people who are considered especially innocent and deserving of protection sometimes in a legal sense, sometimes as a social fact, sometimes both. Children, women, the disabled, the elderly, white people. In America today, a single missing white girl is a tragedy, while a hundred missing black and brown girls is not even a statistic. A black child is an adult in the eyes of the police. And the myth of black men as hypersex and aggressive and monstrous is as old as this country itself. The men we enslaved, got rich off of, and feared, the Haitian men on Chrome, Chrome Avenue, to borrow the words of poet Félix Maurice Oluwa. In 1987, 30 Haitian men, by then former detainees, living in the U.S. and seeking residency, filed a civil lawsuit against the federal government, contending that the misuse of chemical insecticides by detention center staff caused them to develop abnormal breast tissue. The physical damage was so extensive, they had to have surgery. They lost the lawsuit. Many, especially those who felt emasculated, are unwilling to retell and relive this story. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for that sobering um, um, but important um, witnessing, but also um, call to kind of think about bodies out of place in different ways. The next presentation and the last presentation, I know we're running a little bit late, but is um, 
by um, Anna Guevara. Um, Anna Guevara, uh, Professor Anna Guevara is an associate professor and the founding director of the Global Asian Studies program at UIC. Her interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, and community-engaged work focuses on immigrant and transnational labor, the geopolitics of care work, the Philippine diaspora, and critical race and ethnic studies. She co-founded the Displacements Project uh, with me, and she um, holds a PhD in sociology from the University um, of uh, California, Irvine, and her talk today is going to be about the project writ large, Displacements, a People's History of Uptown. <laughs> you can do it. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I think my colleagues at University of California in San Francisco will will um, want to make sure that I call out UC, UCSF, but... Um, <laughs> Undergraduate degree. From yes, the from the ant eaters. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to begin by just uh, saying thank you uh, to uh, my co-panelists for your presentations, John, Gian, and Mario, uh, Gayatri for uh, moderating, and also really a special shout out to Vicky, um, without whose labor this would not be possible. So thank you so much. <laughs> so just thinking about the presentations that came before me, um, in many ways, the project that I'm about to share with you that Gayatri and I co-founded is um, about storytelling. But I think in the process of doing this work, it's we've learned, at least I've learned, I don't want to speak for Gayatri, but I've also learned not just how to become a storyteller, but also how to listen and how to perhaps um, shift when the community asks you to shift and to use the tools that they empower us to use um, rather than you know, really come at them with particular, um, particular medium. So um, this project, as Gayatri um, articulated earlier, is um, one that we co-founded in 2019. It's a public history project. Um, it's a digital uh, multimedia project that um, attempts to, to tell and narrate and share submerged histories in one particular neighborhood in Chicago in the north side called Uptown. And a project of this magnitude really could not have been possible. You know, we could not have done something like this on our own. So I also wanted to acknowledge all of the students um, who have participated and helped build this project. Um, Kenny Allen, Ria Sharma, Shilpa Menon, Tamal Elawala, Abdul Bashir, Laura Sato, and a lot, many, many undergraduate students, uh, some of whom are here and will be here, who have participated in this project. So huge gratitude, gratitude to all of them. So what we are trying to do with this project is to unearth and visualize the long history of displacements in this one uh, neighborhood, as I said, um, called Uptown, from the perspective of racialized uh, communities as a way to tell a different story of Chicago, um, Chicago's urban history, um, and mirror larger themes about indigenous displacement, as John narrated earlier, about the Great Migration, which Gian um, pointed to, about gentrification, about militarism, and most importantly, to connect various issues, um, whether that's militarism and migration, police brutality and gentrification, through the lives of racialized communities and their everyday and historical struggles. So Uptown has been a portal, uh, many of you will know, has been a portal for migrant and immigrant communities with multiple communities that were displaced to this neighborhood. And most importantly, these displacements of various communities in many ways, we're often a product of intentional segregation by design. Native Americans who were displaced from Chicago by treaties, as John highlighted earlier, and later by intentional urban relocation programs that displaced them back to Chicago from reservations. There were also multiple communities that were displaced by wars, many of which the US uh, played a central role 
such as the Southeast Asia, um, Southeast Asia resulting, you know, such as in Southeast Asia resulting in the Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian refugees who relocated to Uptown. Uptown was also home to Bosnians from former Yugoslavia, as well as Eritreans and Ethiopians following the wars in the Horn of Africa. Uptown was also a neighborhood where Japanese Americans were relocated to uh, post-World War II following their incarceration in various ca camps across the US. Puerto Ricans were displaced multiple times in Chicago, nine times according to Jose Chacha Jimenez, who tells this particular story, and their pen penultimate displacement was from Lincoln Park in Uptown, um, or Lincoln Park to Uptown as, as a result of gentrification. The mechanization of the coal mines, as many of you know, um, also pushed uh, white Appalachians and African-American coal miners to Chicago, and many of them migrated and were uh, resettled to Uptown, which became actually the largest um, Appalachian community outside of Appalachia. Uptown was also a destination uh, for African Americans uh, pushed out of the Deep South by Jim Crow laws, and I could you know, enumerate on a number of other communities, but the main point here is to highlight that Uptown has been a port of entry, a port of um, a gate in, in many ways for various migrants across the U.S. As a result, Uptown became this uh, multiracial neighborhood. It was a multiracial anomaly, as some scholars would say, in a segregated city that revealed the underside of that segregated order. And in many ways, Gian talked about this in her presentation. The ways in which people who uh, were thrown together as a result of these histories intentionally actually um, came together to fight back. That is, people who could not fit into the segregated order became a community of people who willfully would not fit into Chicago's uh, segregated order. So what we tried to, to do in this particular project is to trace these uh, various displacements, but also engage in a kind of intentional counter-narrative with these community members who we have been working with um, for a few years now. So um, there's a specific um, kind of ref visual reference on the title of our project, this with a dash placement, really to signify the kind of um, counter-narrative that we're trying to highlight, but also to signify the kind of um, emplacements and placemaking that we are also trying to present as a counter-narrative to multiple forms of displacements that these communities have experienced for decades. So in the interest of time, um, I will highlight one specific example of a counter-narrative, exploring what it means to, to live through this racism and segregation, and um, introduce you to um, one of our key interlocutors, the Winthrop family. So as um, Gian highlighted earlier, segregation um, in Chicago is, I mean, is a well-known fact. And, but when we think about segregation, we often focus only on the South Side. Less well-known is that um, the same tactics of segregation, of redlining, of race-restrictive covenants, of block busing, um, were also deployed on the North Side. And one example was in Uptown, which is one of the earliest settlements of African Americans on the North Side of the city. Uh, thanks to a race-restrictive uh, petition that was circulated and um, spearheaded by the Central Uptown Association, or C. UA and signed by 1,500 white prop, uh, property owners and residents of Uptown who were fearful of the so-called and quote-unquote colored invasion of Uptown, African Americans were segregated to live on just one block of Uptown on the 4600 block of Winthrop Avenue. So in the face of this, you know, I mean, it's this particular segregated order, the residents of this block who referred to themselves as the Winthrop Avenue family came together to form, to figure out a way to live through the segregated order. And they created a tight-knit family, which they are very proud of, and a, a very you know, tight community of uh, members who were trying to just navigate this uh, particular landscape. Much like Sadia Hartman noted, care was an antidote to violence, to racism, to segregation for members of the family, 
a community that continues to exist today, more than 100 years later, but many of whom live elsewhere in Chicago and are because of, and we can talk about this, this in the Q&A, it is very uh, expensive to live in uh, Uptown. And so many of them, while they wish to stay or return to Uptown, are unable to. So they are all, they're scattered throughout the city, but also um, across the U.S. So speaking to the afterlives of slavery in her book, uh, one of the um, one of the inspiration for our work and in the ways that we analyze um, and engage with the Winthrop family is the work of Christina Sharp, who wrote um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, and where she says, even as we experienced, recognized, and lived subjection, we did not simply or only live in subjection and as the subjected. And so this stories of Winthrop Avenue family in many ways echo this statement. They were and are fully aware of the racism and segregation that their ancestors experienced, but they choose and they push us, actually, <laughs> Gayatri and myself, push us to reframe the narrative told about them, uh, told about their stories. And they underscore a counter narrative where they serve as not only merely, you know, as not merely subjects of racism and the so sordid saga of segregation in Uptown, but instead they emphasize love, laughter, sharing food, planting seeds, caring, community building, as their narrative, as the kind of story that they want to tell about themselves. And here are a couple of their stories and um, what I just want to share a few of them with you. One of the fondest memories was right across the street was the playground. And, you know, they didn't have the, you know, nowadays they make swings out of a rubber, a tough rubber. Back then, swings were wooden. So there was always someone jumping off of the swing. Once they get real high, then the swing comes back to hit them in the head, and then you're on your way to the ER, right hospital, to get some stitches. So uh, one of the fondest memories was that playground. Uh, because everything really was based around older, older people. But that was the one thing that belonged to the city, was the playground. And it wasn't always there. But Mama Sophie, which is Sophia O'Brien, right? Uh, her and a few of the other elders, uh, when we had a block party, they made it a project to put a playground there. And, and they did it, and they did it, and it, it's, um, it blessed us. And you say you would play together in the playground. Who, who were all the the Okay, on, on my, well, mainly, it would be uh, my siblings, okay, so it's four mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, on the second store, uh, floor was Miss Green, and she didn't have any children. But on the first floor was Miss Askew, okay? Miss Askew was, um, um, she was white, but her husband, uh, Butch, he was, he was black. So her children were mixed, and mainly it would be playing with them. And to this day, we are still connected. When I say we're a family, Winthrop Avenue, we're family. So another favorite that I remember about Winthrop Avenue, is the back porch. Oh, there was two huge back, uh, big trees. And the leaves hung over the porch. So we were on the third floor. You could actually reach some of the leaves that were hanging. The leaves had beans in them. It, it, it looked like um, whole green peas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. not, but bigger, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, being a girl, you know what we did. We played house. So that was wonderful play. The neighborhood was full of nature. I'm going to say that. So between the trees and, and, and many people have flowers in their backyard. The one thing about the community, you really, unless something was special going on, you really didn't see people playing in the front yard. Or was Miss Brooks? So that is Cheryl Clark. She talks for a long time and she has many stories. And 
I wanted to share that with you because these are the kinds of stories that, um, that they want us to, to tell about the Winthrop Avenue family, about what they remember, and the kind of uh, placemaking strategies that they're also attempting to engage in in this particular, I mean, in a, in a space that has, um, where they're very familiar with this, I mean, they know of the segregated order, they know the state violence has created uh, this particular space and restricted them to this particular space, but the stories they want to tell are these stories that they remember about their families and the kind of home that they've made on this particular block. Um, I wanted to just conclude, I know that um, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to conclude with um, this particular image and the previous slide is, a, um, is part of this image. This is an artwork that was designed by Anandita Vidyarti, who is a, an undergraduate student here um, at UIC who is um, minoring in Global Asian Studies and um, beautiful artist and who is quite talented and she worked with us over the summer to um, look through and listen through some of the interviews that we've conducted with the Winthrop family and try to render their stories um, visually and creatively. So um, she titled this piece, uh, Gold Down Winthrop Avenue, and that is um, explicitly referencing a particular form of art, Japanese art called kintsugi, which is a practice in Japanese pottery that joins broken pieces or potential cracks or imperfections with gold, uh, specifically gold. And it doesn't, and the idea is to not discard the pieces or hide the blemishes or imperfections but instead to highlight and highlight them actually, um, transforming the final product into a new and different, but no less beautiful um, product. And this is just uh, for your information, a 16th century form of art, which has re recently been rediscovered, not only as an art form, but also as a philosophy and a worldview to navigate life. So uh, with her particular artwork, um, what we're trying to, um, what it's allowed us to tell is this particular counter narrative um, narrated by the Winthrop family members who again are fully aware of racism, of the racism that they live through, that their families, their ancestors lived through, the segregation, the segregated order, the violence um, that their ancestors experienced, but choose to focus on the texture of their resilient lives on the laughter, the joy, the pleasures, the collective meals, the light excursions, the dancing on the streets, the abundance of love, and the practices of community building that indicate what it means to live through these practices otherwise. The counter narratives of the Winthrop family reveal a very different story, a different picture than what, that, than what is told about them through the lens of displacement and discrimination. Instead, their counter narratives highlight and narrate stories filled with joy, filled with laughter and caring. And this is a way for them uh, not necessarily to forget their past, but to reframe what is seen and also what is heard, to produce a counter narrative that places them going down uh, Winthrop Avenue with abundance and with gold, uh, sharing joy, laughter, and creating a deeply knit, um, tight knit community that has withstood the test of time. Thank you. Unfortunately, well, it's a nice hopeful note to end on, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. We are all available for, if you people, anybody has questions, please feel free in the break to uh, come up to us and ask us questions, but unfortunately, we'll have to end this session right now. So. Thank you all very much. Right. <laughs>